Our sermon text this morning comes to us from John chapter 19, verses 31 through 42. So again, that's John 19, 31 through 42. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. And he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful for your word. We thank you for John that you called to follow you, to uh, be by your side, to record these things so that we might know them here today, Lord. Would you use uh, this time to speak to our hearts? I pray that you would uh, help me, aid me by your Holy Spirit to communicate truth. Uh, help me to despise all human prestige and powers and capacities that I might have and uh, rely purely on yours uh, and your power and your power to speak through your word. Uh, Lord, would you use me this morning, and would you speak to us? Would you change our hearts because of what we hear? And may we fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus, uh, following him wherever he may call. We thank you for this time. pray you would bless it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's been a wonderful few days. Uh, yesterday, of course, was a highlight. Welcome to the couple. So good to see you here this morning. And a wonderful day, almost the perfect weather for a wedding, I think, in the history of humankind. In fact, no perfect day was found apart from yesterday. I noticed there were no bugs, as well as there being a perfect temperature. There were no bugs. It was just absolutely fantastic. So, so grateful. And it's one of those days you remember, isn't it? It's a memorable day, a wedding. We've had lots this week, the Holloway family. We had a graduation last weekend, William, and then Sam's birthday on Friday. Memorable days, highlights, if, as it were. And uh, our days are filled with highlights, but most of our days are not. Most of the days are the things that happen in between the highlights. We record our year by the sort of main highlights of the year, but we know that most of those days were spent, uh, that were sort of ignored, or we forget pretty quickly. They were the same as last week. They were the in-between times, and it is an in-between time that I want to speak to you about today. Indeed, as the church looks back on history, we shouldn't forget uh, this in-between time between the hanging of Christ on the cross and uh, the resurrection uh, uh, later, we should not forget this time in which he was buried. His body is lifeless. He is not the agent uh, of the actions uh, that are performed, yet uh, there he is. He is described as being the body, uh, the one carried about uh, this way and that, the one being prepared for burial and being buried. And I want to talk about that in between time. I want to talk about it because, indeed, as many of us know in our Christian lives, we not only follow Christ in those high points, 
in the points that are memorable that we point back to, and you remember that time, but we also go through the in-between time. Sometimes those times are similar to the time that we are going to look at here in the Bible, uh, the times at which the world might shout that Jesus is a derelict. You see, He is gone. He has been disposed of. Uh, but rather than seeing Him uh, in that light, I want to see Him in the light that John places upon him. Indeed, the creeds in our history have addressed this by saying we remember that Jesus Christ was crucified, was buried, and then resurrected. And we want to remember that point in Jesus' uh, time. So, let me begin with a quotation from, uh, actually, a Catholic theologian wrote a brilliant book uh, quite a number of years ago called Death on a Friday Afternoon. And he writes this uh, very insightful uh, passage in that book. He says, every human life conceived from eternity and destined to eternity, here finds its story told. In this killing, the one of Jesus, that is, that some call senseless, we are brought to our senses. Here we find out who we most truly are, because here is the one who is what we are called to be. The derelict cries, come follow me. Follow him there, we recoil. We close our eyes. We hurry on to Easter. But we will know what it to do with Easter's light uh, if we shun the friendship of the darkness that is wisdom's way to light. And his point here is don't rush to Easter. Don't rush to the momentous moment, but linger. Linger a while at a point in which Jesus lies lifeless, unable to do anything, is in the hands of whoever comes along to pick him up. And John describes it in such a way that I think brings out this point. We are, of course, called to follow Jesus, not only to the high points, not only to the glorious, victorious moments, but also to those moments where the world cries derelict. Perhaps you find yourself at one of these points today. Perhaps your life is um, a, a matter of being thrown about by events outside of your control. Uh, you're no longer the agent. You're sort of the patient being carted this way and that. It seems that life has got a grip on you. It's dragging you this way and that, and you don't have any control. You're not at the wheel, it seems. Perhaps you have had a, a similar experience to what Jesus would have had in his day, that the people who are in charge get to tell the story, and they get to tell a story that's blatantly false, disparaging. Uh, it's misinformation. Perhaps you will follow a derelict there. This derelict, of course, is not really a derelict at all, but the king. Uh, yet, that's what people would have called him, this one that came, the upstart, uh, the one who tried to usurp our power. I mean, thinking mainly, of course, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those gathered in the Sanhedrin, calling for the death and disposal of Jesus. You might find yourself there, too, that the ones with the most powerful voices are the ones saying all sorts of false things and disparaging things about you. You have followed a derelict king. Perhaps you find yourself in the midst of hostility. It's not rare for Christians. Indeed, it's unusual for us to be found amongst uh, popular people because Christians historically have been those ones who have been hated and uh, persecuted. We even uh, prayed for the persecuted church this morning. Those are those who stand for Christ despite uh, the hostility of their culture. So perhaps you find yourself not up on a mountain, but rather in a valley. You have followed the derelict king, and there you find yourself rather like Jesus. You feel unable to do anything. Uh, you are pushed about by events. Uh, the story is told about you. You can't make the truth known, or perhaps you find yourself in a hostile environment. Well, what do we do, and how should we cope during such a time? Well, I want to look at our passage this morning and uh, make a couple of observations about how John describes Jesus's derelict moment, as Newhouse so poetically puts it. The first thing I want you to notice is that the events, far from carrying Jesus about according to how his opposition want them to go, indeed it seems the events carry him about exactly as he wished to go. Everyone looks like the opposition has got their way. It seems that the Pharisees and the, those who hate Jesus have got exactly what they want. After all, there he is on a cross, dying a criminal's death. Isn't it exactly what they wanted to happen? Uh, 
they have bent the arm of Roman power to their will and have brought about the destruction of this upstart who comes telling everyone that he indeed is Messiah to the people of Israel. Despite his popularity amongst the people, those who opposed Jesus had all the power and they most certainly got their way, didn't they? But John describes the events very differently. He tells us that the very things that the opposition have done to Jesus carry out exactly what Jesus wants. It's indeed Jesus, even though he is lifeless there on the cross and lifeless in the arms of Joe and Nick as they carry him to the grave, he indeed has arranged things so well that everything turns out to be his way, not their way. They don't get what they want. Jesus gets what he wants. And, and that's true of our derelict moments too. Just notice uh, the events as they unfurl. We're described that the day occurs on a special day, and this is, causes the uh, powers of the Jewish authorities to say, look, we need to get these bodies rid of quick. Really, they're talking about Jesus, but they want all the bodies to be disposed of. They want them taken out, and ordinarily, crucified criminals would be thrown to the dogs. Uh, wild beasts would devour their bodies. They would be disposed of with no burial, and uh, just like we get rid of roadkill by vultures, they would have thrown these out, and uh, the dogs would have got them, and that would have been the end of that. This is what they want. They want a disposal pretty quick because they don't want this uh, rabble uh, uprising to occur, the Jesus followers to be any more nuisance. But uh, indeed, they send the Romans to do this. Could you please dispose of these bodies? It's going to be Passover. They want a clean slate. They want to get back to business as usual where they're in charge and their Messiah is no more. At least this pretended Messiah has gone and this is their plan. Of course, as you see, the Romans do comply exactly with their wishes, as they have been doing so far. Uh, we are told that a centurion was sent along with some soldiers, so these were professional crucifiers, and they knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, they knew that in order to kill the uh, victims of crucifixion, they would have to break the legs. These criminals were often hung out there for as it turns out, three days, which is interesting, that they would be hung there for a few days for everyone to see what would happen if you break the rules. You will be sent to crucifixion, but you wouldn't die instantly. Crucifixion wasn't designed to kill instantly. It was designed to kill slowly. And of course, in order to breathe on a cross, you used to have to pull yourself up and push yourself up uh, by the legs so that you could take a breath of air, then descend down again until you could do it again and until you ran out of steam and you could do it no longer. So by breaking the legs, you would ensure that the crucified victim could no longer raise to breathe and therefore you would die of asphyxiation. Uh, it turns out when they arrive that only out of the three that are hanging, only two of them require to have their legs broken. The text tells us that Jesus is already dead, and they saw this, and so they had no need to break the legs of Jesus. Uh, then they pierce the side of Jesus, and out comes blood and water, a strong indication that Jesus is dead. We know that uh, the, when the heart is ruptured, this is exactly what we'd expect. The lungs fill with fluid, a translucent fluid fluid, and so when stabbed in the side, blood would come out along with some fluid. This, so this is an attestation to the death of Christ. Jesus is indeed dead, but what's so interesting about these events is what John has to say about them. He recalls that the prophets have predicted such a thing. Moreover, you can also notice that being the Passover, Jesus is going to be the Passover lamb. Indeed, amazingly, we read what Paul had to say about that this morning as well during our prayer time, that uh, Jesus is the Passover lamb, and the lamb is spotless and will be sacrificed on Passover. And we see that actually some of the indications in Scripture there also tell us that this is the spotless lamb that we so need. For example, if you look at Exodus, uh, the instructions for the Exodus lamb that was slain originally on that day that is celebrated by the Passover may not have any broken bones. And here it is that Jesus indeed fulfills that criteria. Exodus 12, uh, 43 sa uh, says, you may not break any of its bones. Numbers 9, 11 to 12 may not leave any of it until morning or break any of its bones. So Jesus fulfills all the Passover commandments and compliance and instructions for being this perfect Passover lamb. Moreover, John indicates and quotes from the prophets who uh, predict that they will pierce the side of this one who is the anointed one of Israel. 
Uh, he protects all his bones, it says in Psalm 34, and not one of them is broken. Uh, the residents of Jerusalem, it says in Zechariah 12:10. Uh, we'll look at me whom they pierced. There we go. There's the piercing of the side. And in Isaiah 53, verse 5, the famous passage in which it says, he was pierced because of our rebellion or for our transgressions, as some of your versions may say. This is indeed not just what the opposition to Jesus want, but is indeed precisely the plan of Christ Himself. Uh, this is meticulously planned in advance, and Jesus gets His way. But isn't that amazing that He gets His way and He's utterly lifeless on the cross, and yet all things are working out the plan of our divine King. Now, for many of us, this is difficult for us to apply, isn't it? Uh, because it requires a level of trust that goes beyond our ordinary strength to trust in God. During our in-between times, if you like, uh, we're often left thinking, well, God will work again, but He's hanging around somewhere else until such an opportunity is given Him. It's very difficult to think of God working His plan out through our in-between times, the down times, the bits when events seem to have control over us. How on earth can God be working in this situation, we might inquire. I think I've had struggles with this. It's during times when things don't go my way, where I think that God hasn't really turned up, then I fail to trust that these are really the plans of God. I don't know about you, but it's much easier, isn't it, to trust when God has provided what you wanted and given what you need, you say, ah, oh, I trust God. He has provided all that I wanted and given me what I need. But it's in those times when neither of those conditions are met that we find it most difficult to trust God. Isn't that when our trust ebbs and flows, it's undecided, it sort of decreases in level, and we wait until we can trust Him again when He does again provide for us? But in an in-between time, a time of, uh, of being riding the wave of other people's actions, of being thrown this way and that, we sometimes find it very difficult to trust God, but that's precisely when we should. And John indicates here is that even when Jesus lies lifeless, uh, He is still in full control. He still has oriented events according to His plan, and that's true for those who follow Him. You follow a derelict king, you might feel like a derelict, the might, world might call you derelict, yet God is still in control. He is still getting His way. Uh, a few years ago, quite some number of years ago now, uh, some dear friends of ours lost uh, one of their children, a, a, an event which uh, I cannot even comprehend how difficult it must have been to go through. Certainly, if you were going to follow into a valley, this would be the deepest and darkest of all kinds of valleys that human beings can know about. Uh, losing a child must be the greatest fear of every parent and the darkest moment when it happens. And these dear friends of mine were greatly rocked, and they asked this very question, how can I trust God when all of this happens, when I lose what I love the most, what I believe that God had granted me as a gift, and it is taken from my hands? How on earth can I cope with that? Well, an, the author of an excellent book on this, uh, which is the, the uh, mother of uh, the son that was lost, Jessica, uh, wrote a, a brilliant book on trusting God even when the worst things happen. But it wasn't until after they'd lost their son that they uh, discovered trust in God. And it happened in an incident where another one of their sons went missing. And this son ran off, it's in the middle of Minnesota in the woods, out in the middle of nowhere, and they went off into the woods or ran off and they were looking for their son everywhere. Uh, his name is Gavin, and, and Gavin just went off for a run in the woods, he went, disappeared, and Jessica was chasing around looking for him, and Bart, the dad, was looking all over and they couldn't find him, and it was a dreadful moment. How could you do this, Lord? How could I lose another son? It can't happen. How can I trust you, God? And that was her big thought. And I want to read you an excerpt from her book, which describes how she learned something about trust from being unable to do anything to save or protect her son, who did turn up eventually. So uh, this was not a second lost child for, for good, but 
a temporary one, but it taught her something about trust. And it's always struck me as a powerful way that we learn about trust, especially when we follow Jesus into those dark times. It was then, she says, in that moment of desperation and utter helplessness that I finally realized how very small and insignificant I really was. I was one little person with a very limited view. I could see only what was right in front of me. I had no way of knowing where my little boy was. In that same moment, the truth and reality of God's power and might became ever so real to me. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere all at once, and He is all-knowing. He, uh, he knew right where Gavin was, and He could be with him, protecting him while I searched for him. I finally realized that I could trust God, and I had to trust God because I had no other choice. That's the crucial thing she learns. I realized up until then, even when I thought I trusted God, it was only because of the things He had done for me. I decided whether or not He was trustworthy based on how well He performed. I would trust Him if things worked out the way I wanted them to. If bad things ever happened or things didn't make sense to me, I would take back all the trust. But when we put our trust in God only because of the things He does for us in good times, our faith is almost sure to flounder during the storms that come into our lives. And believe me, there will be storms. Faith in God needs to be based on something other than the circumstantial. It needs to be based on something rock solid and unshakable. We should trust God simply because we have no other choice but to. It sounds so simple, like there must be more, but really... What war does one need to say? God is God, and we are not. John describes these events in such ways that you are led to believe that God is God and we are not. Not even the most powerful empires on earth can thwart the power and will of God. Not even the most important people with the loudest voices and the most military might can outsmart God's plan. God gets His way despite every effort to thwart it. And in our dark times, we should remember that God always gets His way and we can always trust Him. But it's sometimes only in those times where we follow the derelict, where we learn that magnificent lesson. The second uh, part of what I want to say, and I think John is indicating here, is that in those times when the narrative or what people say is all the other way, uh, Jesus will be vindicated. Notice how insistent John is on proclaiming that this is his testimony to the truth. You'll find those verses, a powerful statement of an eyewitness. Well, what does he say? He says, he who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows he is telling the truth. This is very self-referential in John's gospel. I saw these things happen. Now, why is it important that we might know this? Well, just think of yourself from the other side for a minute. Uh, you not only, as a Pharisee who has kind of brought about this event of the crucifixion of Jesus, want the body to be disposed of, but you also want the memory to be forgotten. Uh, we know that in that time, and even in our time, there is a great deal of value placed on having what people say about you even after the, your death. Indeed, those of you who have read uh, Homer's Iliad will remember that this is Achilles' dilemma, right? You either follow your fate to death and then get eternal glory, immutable glory. It goes on forever. Everyone's always going to talk about Achilles, which is kind of true. We're still talking about him. Uh, or you can, uh, you can live a long life and die uh, with no one knowing your name. And, uh, of course, he ultimately is somewhat forced to, uh, to gain glory for eternity. No, people would have worried about Jesus having such a power. Jesus might be dead, but you want him forgotten. You don't want people to remember Jesus. You want it to be the case that in a couple of years' time, people say, you remember that Jesus? And someone says, no, I don't, I don't, who, who are you talking about? Or someone might say, oh, I remember that guy. Didn't they? Did they crucify him? Yeah, that's right. And then after five years, no one mentions the name. After 10, it's completely forgotten. It's one of those moments, those little blips in history. Uh, we're back to normal now, thinks the Pharisee. Uh, we don't have to think about that man ever again. No one will think about him again. Unfortunately for them, Jesus uh, turns uh, to the crucifixion, is crucified, and at the moment where you think no one else would be paying attention, John is still there. He is waiting, watching Jesus. 
Jesus is dead. Why watch a dead man, would think the Pharisees, but John knows better. He turns up and he witnesses the events that occur following the crucifixion of Jesus. Isn't that cool? John is right there. He sees all this thing happen. And moreover, if it was just he saw it would be bad enough for the Pharisees, but he writes it down. And so John turns out to write this gospel to tell us exactly what he saw happen with his very own eyes. He was a witness and a writer, and in doing so, sparked a flame that no Pharisee or empire could put out. And many, let me tell you, have tried. If you read the history of the church in the world, you will find lots of efforts to stamp out John, uh, to burn his pages, to eradicate his memories. We've had political powers to up upend Europe and try to destroy the memory of Jesus. We have political powers today that if you were to bring a Bible, you might go to prison for the rest of your life. Many people try to blot out the memory of Jesus. People who hate him will often try and get rid of his sentences, the ones written about him. Uh, but as we have seen, they have remained failures in history to remove the memory of Jesus Christ. And it's largely due to the witnesses who saw what happened, one of them being John. So this is a powerful statement. And it tells us something that's kind of true universally. Hopefully, most times, the truth wins out. Certainly, in this case, the truth will win. But if you think back to the American Revolution, there was lots of uh, attempts to thwart the truth then. And our, there's a wonderful line from George Washington, who in 1794 wrote, truth will ultimately prevail where pains are taken to bring it to light. Now, you can know that the pains of John to bring this to light were pretty grave. After all, he is anonymous in his own uh, record of the events. He refers to himself as the beloved disciple, uh, and he has relatives in Jerusalem who would be affected if anyone knew this was him, and presumably he's writing in part to protect his relatives, his family that live in Jerusalem from repercussions of saying something that is not politically correct. Uh, but he does so nonetheless, and we know that that would have been a great pain to him, of course. Uh, most of the apostles, disciples who followed Jesus in this way, proclaimed the gospel, suffered deaths as a result of their proclamations. Uh, so you can see it was of great pains to them. Indeed, as we testify to the truth, there is a cost to us too. We know very well what happens when we proclaim the gospel in a hostile environment. There will be some who perhaps might listen, believe, and appreciate what we have to say, but there will be many others who will cause us pain as a result. Nearly every time I have done evangelizing in the world, I have noticed that there's always some kind of pain or cost, uh, sometimes to my friends, sometimes to me directly, but there's always something you have to go through when you are willing at pains to tell the truth. But, Washington says, uh, it always wins out in the end, as long as there's someone who's prepared to go through that small amount of pain to continue to proclaim the truth. I had a friend of mine, uh, Mark his name was, he was an Irishman, so that really tempts me to do an Irish accent, but I'm going to refrain just in case. Well, I should, maybe I should. There he is. Mark from Ireland. <laughs> right, that's right, so it is. Uh, and he came to England for a right good crack. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, so Mark was from uh, Ireland, a beautiful uh, area of Southern Ireland, and he, a very good friend of mine, um, we spent many years together uh, ministering together. He, as a young man, was a lost soul, had no idea what he was going to do with his life, and really didn't know about himself, and wanted to go on a kind of journey of self-discovery. He was a bit of a hippie. And so he decided to get on a boat and come to England, and he was going to go to London from where he was going to uh, earn some money and then disappear around the world, go off and do a big world trip and find out his real calling in life, and, and then that would be it. He was sort of looking for an aha moment, perhaps. Well, he only made it as far as London because while he was there, he uh, ended up in the East End of London. I won't do an East End accent because this will just take me too far afield. I'll start doing accents. Uh, but in the East End of London, he uh, started going to this wonderful little Baptist church. And in this Baptist church, there were lots of wonderful mothers who cooked 
and they led him to the Lord by food, uh, which is often the way. Uh, so if you're good at cooking, this is a good evangelistic tool. Uh, invite people to taste your food and then tell them the gospel. If, it, if, if the gospel's anything as good as your food, they may listen to it, as maybe perhaps what goes on psychologically speaking. Nonetheless, Mark was loved into the kingdom by a bunch of very, very good uh, women cooks. And having been loved into the kingdom, he then began to love Jesus. This one slain for his sin, took on his sin, paid the price for his sin, in whom he discovered his true identity. What need is Mark of the world now? He has exactly what he came for in a small, slightly under the gun, slightly poor Baptist church in the east end of London. Um, and there he was saved, and there he wished to minister. And one Sunday, the pastor said, we need some help with teenagers around here. Now, Mark looked around the church and said, I don't see any teenagers. I wonder what they need help with. Well, of course, they wanted to have teenagers in the church and needed someone to reach out to them. So Mark willingly volunteered, having no really idea of what he was doing, but willing to give it a go, said, I'll do that. I'll help reach some teenagers with the gospel. And so the next week, Mark thought, well, I've said I'll do it, so I'm going to go and have a go. So off he went, and uh, he walked down the road and saw that there was a school. And uh, in the school, he walked, thinking, teenagers go to school. That's where I'll go hang out. So he walked into the school, and as he was walking towards the door there, he saw uh, five or six young girls carrying uh, guitar cases. And he went up to uh, this little group, and he said, hey, good morning, Uh, do you play guitar then? Uh, No, these are machine guns. No, they're they're guitars. Okay, we've got guitars in here. Yes, we 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 kind of play guitar. We we would like to play guitar, and we brought our guitars to school because we were going to get a guitar teacher here to teach us after school. But unfortunately, he's told us he can't do it anymore, so we don't have a guitar teacher, so we would like to play the guitar, but we can't. So Mark, thinking, aha, I have teenagers, and I can invite them to learn the guitar, said, oh, well, I'll, I'll teach you the guitar. And so uh, Mark said, you know, come round next Tuesday if you bring round your guitars uh, to the church. It's just down the road here. I'll teach guitar for you. And the girl said, okay, yes, we'll do that. We'll bring our friends, too. We can all learn the guitar together. And so Mark was very pleased with himself. And so out the school he walked, and right down the street he went to a guitar shop. And uh, that was because he needed a guitar, because Mark had never played one in his life before and realized he was going to have to learn. So for about a week, Mark played until his fingers bled. That's all he did. I imagine the pastor who asked for some help with the youth maybe thought, yeah, I don't know, this this wasn't what we had in mind. But there was Mark making a big old noise with his guitar all week, playing till his fingers bled. And eventually the girls turn up next week and he gives them their first guitar lesson. And I'm sure perhaps maybe some of them cottoned on to the fact that he had not played very much before. Perhaps the blood streaming down his hand from having rip them on the, the, the metal strings perhaps might have been an indication, uh, or perhaps the fact that he was probably really bad at it. And nonetheless, they enjoyed themselves, and with Mark, uh, always people enjoy themselves. He was the most fun-loving character. And uh, so they came back next week, and Mark all week would learn something and then teach it to them the next week, and eventually um, he was able to share the gospel. Now, I know uh, the fruit of Mark's ministry, of his desire to tell them the truth and the pain that it cost him to do it, because a couple of years later when I became friends with Mark, he invited me to speak at a youth event that he was running in the basement of his church, and that's where they had youth events. So I turned up, and I arrived at the church, and I was greeted by this small group of, of girls, and uh, they were all making the drinks and, the, and doing stuff for the event, and Mark introduced them. And those were the girls that were his guitar students, now all Christians, now all serving in the youth group and ministering to their friends. And that night, uh, Mark had managed to amass 300 kids from the local neighborhood to come in and hear band and hear me uh, preach the gospel. And we did so magnificently that night, and it was a glorious night. Uh, But it reminds me always that Mark's process for getting the truth to these girls always required some pain. And it might not be the pain of having to learn a guitar, it might be much more serious. Uh, indeed, in that area, which was mostly Muslim, in the east end of London, in, uh, in uh, East Ham, was predominantly Muslim. In fact, when I lived on that street, because I went to work in that church for a year with Mark, uh, there, we were, there were very few Christians around, mostly Muslims. And uh, so this was very dangerous, actually, for Mark to proclaim the gospel. I went into the same school uh, with him, and we had a Christian assembly whilst they had a Muslim assembly upstairs 
upstairs for most of the school, and then we had this small gathering of Christians, and they brought some of their friends with them. So Mark continued to minister to these people. The pain, though, of what it takes to tell the truth isn't insignificant, but it is worth it, and that's what John's testimony tells us. I saw these things. Believe me, these things really happened. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed one of Israel. I saw it happen, he says. It's going to cost me my life, he says. If anybody finds out it's me, it's going to cost me my family. It's going to cost me everything, but it's worth it because the truth must win. And in our times of dereliction, if you like, our testimony must reflect that fact. It doesn't matter what it costs. The truth has got to win. I can't do anything about the truth. It won't bend to me. I have to bend to it. And the truth of the gospel is what we treasure most magnificently when we are in our time of desperate need. In fact, your most powerful proclamations of the gospel in your life are sometimes when you feel the least able to proclaim because it's all you've got. It's the biggest treasure you own is the truth of the gospel. And John has it right there at that moment. You imagine he is seeing his friend, his Savior, his Lord, his Messiah, nailed to a cross, blood streaming from his pierced side. And yet he says, I saw these things. Why is that important? Because that is God himself hung there, our Messiah, Savior of the world, Lord of all things. And to him we owe our worship. And that's the final point I want to make uh, this morning, is that when we are in that in-between time, the derelict moment, we can but worship Jesus. And notice here John magnificently describes a couple of worshipers. He describes a couple of worshipers who come to bury Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. You've met them in the Gospels. They're both wealthy. They're both powerful. They're both the kind of people you'd expect to be in the opposition side, yet they are disciples, followers, and worshipers of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man, gives up, plausibly, we think, his grave, for it is his grave that they take the body to. It is nearby to the site of crucifixion, and he says, I will give up my grave for the one whom I should, my Messiah, the Lord of all things. I'm going to worship the Messiah with what I have. I'm going to give him my grave. Uh, the other man there is Nicodemus, probably more famous from uh, Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus. Nicodemus actually has been defending Jesus in the Sanhedrin, trying to persuade them not to crucify him, uh, the Gospels tell us. And he too turns up, and he has, comes with an exorbitant amount of spices. And the Gospels are replete with these moments, you know, the pouring of the oil that's expensive, the perfume, onto Jesus, and this extravagant worship. That's how worship is uh, when you meet Jesus. It's extravagant. You'll just give everything you've got. He brings all the spices he can possibly muster. He too is a wealthy and powerful man, and uses it all up. Uh, for this burial of the man who is Jesus, who crucified for him and died and will be raised again. But worthy of worship. Here are two worshipers, John says. Notice that even in lifeless form, Jesus lies dead as they pick him and pluck him from the cross, perhaps pulling out the nails or even pulling his hand from the nail, ripping his flesh more. They carry his lifeless body, this body that can do nothing, yet they bow and worship their Messiah still. Even lifeless, even when everything looks like he's not there, they bow and they worship him with their best. They bring their own grave and all the spices they can muster, a truly royal burial. Of course, you can think about all sorts of Old Testament passages that predict that the king of kings will come, die a criminal's death, but be buried as a king, a wealthy man. And this is all fulfilled in the actions of Joe and Nick, as I like to call them. Uh, this wonderful pair, can you imagine carrying Jesus to the grave, wrapping him gently, uh, treating his body with veneration and reverence because they know who this is. This is the one worthy of all I have. And I think that is a final and good point for us to learn. When you follow a derelict king, you follow him primarily as his worshiper. If nothing else, if you are bound and gagged, if you are unable to do anything else, you are a worshiper of Christ. Everything you have can be used up for him. In fact, that's a glorious metaphor, isn't it? Don't we want to use up what we have for Christ? Not waste it, but use it up as worship. Use what you have, whatever it might be. You might have spices to give, graves to donate. 
Uh, but you might have all sorts of other things, your talent, your money, your time, your love, your w- praises of your mouth, all to be used up. So you've got nothing left at the end uh, to worship the king. Uh, when you use it up like that, that's not wasting. It's worshiping. And Jesus loves worship more than anything else. He doesn't mind if the world looks at you and says you're nuts. You give all your money to missions so that you can reach a mil- millions of people overseas, of which there's like one Christian per zillion people. Uh, you think that's an effective use of money? Why not invest it? And you say, no, these are the greatest investments I have. Why? Because they're worship. That's the act of worship, the act of giving is a magnificent scent uh, for the Lord as you give to Him. I told my wife, I said, how about the expression, use it up? Isn't that a good expression for worship? You use up what you've got, but you use it up. And she said, yeah, it's great. I feel used up. <laughs> I said, yes, that's probably a parent's feeling, isn't it? You've used up everything you've got and you're worn out. But I said, that's so good uh, as a worshiper that you've used up your life for God. There's a wonderful movie that's very difficult to watch, and I haven't let my boys see it yet because it's very, it sticks in the mind. It's about a man called Oscar Schindler who attempted to save multiple Jews uh, during World War II when they were uh, killing them um, indiscriminately. And uh, Schindler's List, directed by Steven Spielberg, was a powerful movie for anybody who saw it. And probably the scene that you can't make it through without crying is the final scene in which Oscar Schindler wishes he could have got more people out. And the ways he could have done it is using up his stuff. Uh, So he uh, comes to the point where he can see all the people he saved uh, from this Nazi attempt to kill the Jews. And he says, but I could have got more. And there's this terrifying scene at the end where he realizes he still had more things. And he begins to pull them from himself. He has a gold swastika, of course, because he has to appear to be on the German side in order to purchase uh, these people for work in his factory and therefore avoiding their death. And he then points at his car and he says, I could have got 10 more. Uh, There's a man who wished he could have used it all up. And that's a heart of worship when it's using it up for Jesus. Whatever you have, um, whatever you own, whatever you've got in your life, may you use it up for the Lord, Uh, even in the time uh, where everybody thinks Jesus is gone. Just think the Pharisees just believe that everyone's going to live in eternal hostility to this man. Not only will he be forgotten, he will be his body disposed of, his memory eradicated, but in its place a deep hostility which will never fade. That's the intention, isn't it? Yet here we find Joe and Nick Two of many, as it will turn out, that love Jesus are prepared to use whatever they have for his glory, to worship his holy name. May we be worshipers when we follow our derelict king in those times, those in-between times. Of course, they are in-between times, and we know for the very next page, we turn and we see Mary visiting the tomb, and we know that Jesus indeed has been resurrected. He has been appointed judge of all the earth as being resurrected from the dead, having beaten death, having given us hope of a resurrection and a future. He has gone from being judged by the powers that be, the Roman authorities and the Pharisees as they have bent the will of Rome, and he has now become judge of all things, judge of the world, as Paul tells us in Acts 17. The resurrection has elevated Jesus to be the judge of all things, of all people. I wonder about you this morning. Uh, Perhaps you find yourself in a time of having followed the derelict king, in an in-between time perhaps. What is God doing? I don't know. Has he left me till he comes and appears again in my life? Uh, Perhaps you find yourself uh, bashed about by the events and activities of others, never ever able to get a grip on things. Perhaps trusting the Lord is difficult in this time. And I want you to see this morning that he is trustworthy, that his plan is always uh, being carried out. How are you maligned, perhaps? Uh, You love Jesus, and now you are told bad things about Jesus. You are hearing all the offensive things to be said about Jesus, and perhaps even about you. Uh, Perhaps uh, you are in a time of being despised for your faith. Uh, To you, I want to encourage you that even in his least powerful moment, according to how we view it, his derelict moment, I put in inverted commas, uh, Jesus still gets his way. He still has the truth, and he still is worthy of worship. Perhaps you are yet to follow. Perhaps you do not know our King, the one who died for you. You do not know his magnificence. Perhaps you find yourself 
right? thinking that you can control everything that you do, that you are in charge, you are not thrown about, uh, that's just Christians, I am fully in charge, in control, I will get what I want. Perhaps you believe falsehoods about Jesus, you don't believe He is the Messiah, the King of all, and to you I ask, uh, turn to Him, repent. You have heard this King who will win, uh, there is no doubt, our faith can be sure, and yet uh, you remain hostile in your attitudes towards Him. I just appeal to you this morning that you might repent, turn to the Lord Jesus, receive the sweetest gift of all that no one can purchase but only Christ, and that is the forgiveness for your sin, and receive His Spirit uh, to give you that long-lasting eternal joy and eternal life with Him. Let us pray together and uh, enjoy this amazing truth about Jesus, His wonderful vindication, uh, His wonderful uh, worship, and His resurrection. Lord, we thank You for this time. We thank You for Your Word. We pray, Lord, that You might work in the hearts of those who are here. Uh, may it be applied to the heart and to actions this week. May we testify to Your truth, uh, never giving up, even if it might cost us pain, whatever that pain might be. May we be worshipers this week, though, Lord, we may have much. May we see it not as ours, but as yours to use for your glory. May we feel used up at the end of the day, not just because we're tired, but because we've used everything uh, to worship you. May we be those who trust you, even when things to be, appear to be going the opposite direction. Lord, would you help us this week by the power of your Spirit and the truth of your Word? And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.